everyone and thanks for tuning in for this episode of New Age Engineering. My name is Adam Furmanek and today I have two fantastic guests with me. First is Roy Krieger, CEO of Metis, and with us is also Shimon Toad, CNCF ambassador. Hello, Fox. Hey, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Lovely. Hey, Adam. So today topic is DevOps challenge when scaling your production or company. So this is what we are going to talk for the next 40 something like minutes. But before jumping straight to it, how about we introduce our guests? So Roy, maybe a couple words about yourself. So hi, nice to meet you. My name is Roy. I'm the CEO of uh, Metis, uh, building developer tools around database. Uh, based in Israel, in a city called Petah Tikva, which is basically the New Jersey of uh, Tel Aviv. Uh, and yeah, married, small kid. Cool, glad you're here with us. Shimon, how about you? Yeah, so hi everyone, thanks for having me. So I'm a CNCF ambassador. My background is in uh, DevOps and infrastructure. I was a general manager of leading infrastructure divisions for uh, a media company. Also, I have a YouTube channel called Shimon Ops, and I make educational videos about Kubernetes and Open Telemetry and all of the cloud native workloads. And really, I fell in love with open source and programming when I was 13 years old, when I installed my first Linux. And ever since, I've been geeking around software development and how to scale companies. That sounds cool. Uh, uh, by the way, I highly recommend uh, Shimon's channel. Let's do a bit of promotion of what you want to do. Lovely. We'll Thank put a link to the channel and to other stuff we mentioned in this episode in the notes attached to this uh, to this video. Um, okay, folks. So the topic for today is like scaling company, scaling products, challenges, other stuff. Like when I think about that, I actually don't even know what's the difference between scaling the company and scaling the product. Isn't like it the same? How does it change? Shimon, do you want to start? You have like worked in one of the highest growth uh, companies in Israel. So maybe you can share some experience and uh, insight around that. Yeah, so actually I've worked at a company that's now merged with Unity, the, the great uh, company that uh, is the maker of the tools for, soft, for, for game development. Um, and when I joined the company, we were just 30 people. And when I left, we were a thousand people. And, you know, part of my job was to help scale the organization and the infrastructure. And I think that those are two different things, because on the one hand, you need to scale people and processes within the organization in terms of who reports to, to, to who and how to work and how do we make tickets and, and how do we make sure that we work on the right priorities. And then on the other hand, you have scaling engineering, whereas we have more customers onboarding, we have more traffic coming from the same customers, and how do we make sure that our, um, how we make sure that our production is scalable enough to, to hold all of those changes? And at the end of the day, I think that both of them collide because you need your system to be elastic, but you also need to, to have the people, to have the ability to work on it in an easy manner. Let's say a monolith with 1,000 engineers might be a little bit challenging to, to work on, for, an, for example. Yeah, I totally agree with Shimon. Like, from my experience and the way I see it is that one cannot live without the other. Like you cannot scale literally your production environment without changing like the processes. Like you start with everybody is pushing code. You're just trying to get to the market as soon as possible. And then suddenly you, you understand that you have product market fit or starting to have product market fit. And then you feel like the entire air being sucked in and like a huge pull motion on your product and everything collapsed. So you're trying to get as many developers or engineer and, and support and all those organization, but at the same time, you need to change the way you build your production environment to accommodate like that specific, uh, the, the growth. So you need to have the right people and the right processes. And also, I think something that is not really being talked about enough is the right tooling. How do you choose what tooling, what gates are you doing? 
Uh, and this is, I think, maybe part of the processes Shimon mentioned, but I would argue it's also part of like, I would call it literally, this is the enablement for growing your production environment. Otherwise it's going to break all the time. So this reminds me uh, when you when you mentioned tooling and scaling product and other stuff. We all know in computer science there is a thing called Conway's law, so that the software architecture resembles the the, the organizational architecture. And I remember, I think it was Netflix that said that they started doing microservices not because of the the product, but because they couldn't manage people anymore. Um, what do you think about that? Like you mentioned tooling, but how does tooling apply to that? Should we also change our tools to microservices, all of that, like when we scale our product or any differences in that? Like, Roy, what's your call on this? So, like, I totally agree because when you, it used to be like you had like maybe companies with 20,000 engineers and, you know, I'm talking old school enterprises, but uh, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the law of uh, residential uh, efficiency was so low. So the 28,000 engineer barely uh, had the ability to contribute to, to, the, to the business. And I think like what you mentioned around Netflix, it's the only way if you have the ability to scale out and the way you scale out is you're creating siloed or semi-siloed uh, services or topics that certain types of engineer are independent and you have, you let them and give them the right tooling and, you know, the ability to move fast and have self-service. We are all, our entire industry is all about now self-service. And for a reason, you cannot move fast in today's so competitive environment without letting teams, whether it be customer success or engineering, this is something we're trying to do within Metis as well, have the ability to decide things by themselves be a decision maker and at the same time have the independence but you have to keep some kind of governance around that and i'm sure shimon uh uh can tap around that and basically he managed a huge organization uh, i'd love to hear your thoughts about it but from my experience that's i think maybe i'll draw like both sides so like there is the one I think like showing both extremes helps us understand where could be a good middle ground. So on the one side, you can have, let's say, a thousand engineers working on one monolith. And then there is a lot of dependency on one another because everyone is touch, stepping on everyone's toes. And it's really, really difficult to synchronize everything. On the other hand, you have the other side of the spectrum, which is uh, everyone does whatever they want and everyone builds whatever they need, but then you have a lot of duplication. So you don't have any platform engineering team that actually says, okay, I have 10 microservices that need, I don't know, authentication, authorization, observability, and instead of 10 teams building it 10 times, we'll have one team that builds it and everyone will use it. So in some area, there is a equilibrium that makes it good. Um, I think that an interesting point is Jeff Bezos, when he talked about AWS, he said, I'd rather have five of the same thing instead of zero. And in AWS, when you look at services, you have, a, I'm very close with AWS, you have a GM for a service, there is a product lead, there is an engineering lead, and they, in general, get autonomy, and they can go and, and really move fast. Of course, they need to adhere by the security and compliance and all of that, but it is not unheard of that, like you have service A and on the edge of it, you have another service that does the same thing on the other edge of the service. And they almost uh, sometimes compete by themselves. Um, and I think we need to strive to get to this equilibrium. But this is actually the same case we have in software engineering, right? When like there is this don't repeat yourself dry rule, right? How do I know when to like stop repeating myself or how do I know whether I can build something independently, which would be a duplication according to what you're saying? So I think it, it, it comes back to the synchronization. Um, and I think that once you identify and you say, okay, we have five product teams and one infra team, platform team that is going to be responsible. Um, and the tough thing is how do I make sure that I don't 
repeat myself five times before I understand that it has to be, you know, uh, across the board. And on the other hand, how do I not do premature optimization in, in order to, you know, build some crazy thing that will be only built once. Um, and I guess that, you know, uh, harmony and syncing between the different teams, if we look at Conway Law and like talking between the organization itself is very, very important. When I was a GM of an infrastructure division, every week I would sit with the VP R&Ds of all the teams and I would ask them, what are you working on? What are you working on? What are you working on? And by, that, by understanding what each one of them is working on, it would help me say, hey, you and all of the rest need an event collecting system. Maybe I should build it for you instead of each one of you building it by themselves. I think that like from my experience and I'll tap on the last sentence Shimon just said is uh, it's in, in a certain scale, it's inevitable that you're going to have duplication if you really want to move fast and your, your target optimization is like running fast and you are paying with uh, inefficiency around that. But it's boiled down from my experience to transparency and honesty. Like if a company really has transparency, it won't eliminate many things, but people will understand what and know what other divisions are doing to some extent. And you reduce like the, the duplication and, and inefficiencies you have in the company. So from my experience, you can, it, it is also a structural issue, but it's more of a cultural issue to have the ability to reduce the amount of duplication. Yeah. But let's talk tech, okay? So I think that there are some, some uh, things that you can do that will help you make the right decision. So number one, if you say each service is API compliant, so everything talks, you decide whatever you want, but you could say every service has an HTTP endpoint or reads from a queue, and this is how you communicate with it. And then it allows for other services to use it as an infrastructural service. And then every, every piece of code that is being written is like productized and can be consumed by another service. Um, which is very different than writing something that is closed and then if you want to change you need to actually request from the other team and you need to somehow c connect with it. So if we make it API first, um, then it will be much easier to integrate. Totally agree. Okay, so that's one thing, API first. What other things can we put in place then uh, that would I actually don't know whether we are targeting. Like we accepted already that, hey, we do have some duplication and this is inevitable as we mentioned, but probably we would like to limit that to have it under control, right? So what are other mechanisms could we put in place to have that under control? <laughs> so make it easy for other people to consume other services. Um, and also I think it comes back to the non-technical side, which is how do you, put like points of interest in the company of who is responsible for what. Um, and something that uh, going back to the technical side today, there are IDP products, uh, which is um, developer portals that allow for a service catalog in discovery and to understand what you even have. Because uh, like a story that happened to me is that uh, in one company that I worked, we wanted to make a web app that will be a desktop application. And at the time, there were two main technologies that uh, you could do it with. Uh, there was Electron and then there was another one. And uh, we, like, we chose for some reasons the other one. And then we started working on it. Uh, and then when we were in the elevator, we heard someone say Electron. And we're like, did you, did you just say Electron? You're like, yeah. He's like, do you work with Electron? He's like, yeah, of course, for like two years now. We're like, what? H how did we choose the competitive technology? I just didn't know. And it just, just happened to be in the elevator that I found out that we're now like building on two competitive technologies. So s somehow being able to have a catalog might help us, I think. Yeah, I agree that like catalog might, might help, but I think that I'll repeat myself again, it's the end of the day, it's just like Shimon presented, it is a cultural thing, like, or transparency thing. If you know that company uses a certain technology, so you would probably go with the team and ask them about the technology and uh, 
probably you're going to opt for the same technology and not adopt for different technology usually. But in the end of the day, I think like Shimon, uh, from my experience, that's what you pay when you're doing shift left and give autonomy for developers. That, you don't have like uh, uh, a perfect world, right? So you pay in one thing and you you earn or uh, you get value on the other side. And usually those two collide and you have to choose on each stage of the company what you prefer and how to limit certain aspect of autonomy versus like uh, speed and, and velocity. I agree. That's... I want I want to give another example. So uh, I'm one of the creators of uh, the open source, the tree, which prevents misconfigurations in Kubernetes. And when I talk to custom like to companies that uh, use Kubernetes in scale, so there's always like two sides. And the side is like the, the DevOps team and the security team. And I ask them, are you a community police or are you a sheriff? And what is that question? <laughs> and the question is like one organization might have developers and they can do whatever they want. And they have DevOps and security as community police. They tell them like, this is the good thing to do. We hope that you do this and that. And then there's the other way around where it's like the sheriffs. And you go like, everything's locked. This is what you're only allowed to do. And if you want something else, you need to open a ticket and get access from us. And of course, both approaches bring, bring troubles, right? Each one has their own uh, limitations and capabilities where like on the one hand, when you, everything is open, it's like the wild, wild west. And um, it's very hard for the security and DevOps teams because they're like, they don't know what's going on. And, and on the other hand, when you have the more strict approach, it's very hard for the R&D teams because they're crippled down and they're also bombarding the DevOps team with tickets to have some changes or modifications. And guess what? The DevOps team, it's not like their, their best use of time to like do tickets, uh, change this memory limit or have this configuration change. And I guess that guardrails is something in the middle where we have rules. So as long as everyone works within the rules, it, it might help. So that's a topic we might talk about. Yeah, what comes to my mind is I once worked in a company that was kind of on the sheriff side, as you described. The problem was that, well, there were so many teams working on products independently. Then when you wanted to start a new product, you obviously had some templates or some, you know, bootstrap projects that would make this faster. So you click, you start a template and bang, you get like immediately 20 different tickets because you use old libraries, because you do something wrong, because you don't have policies in a like AWS with cloud permissions and whatnot. Um, and this is like, you have those two worlds that you can in theory go fast, but then some sheriff comes and slaps your hands just because you did that. Usually, usually his name is uh, CISO. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, someone on, on behalf of the CISO, I guess, yeah. On behalf of the CISO, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so, uh, but on the other hand, I don't actually imagine or I can't imagine how security could be done in this area. I mean, we know what DevOps is. Uh, we now have this trend of DevSecOps that security is kind of like merged as just in DevOps, but I, I don't see that prevalent. I mean, security is something I can't imagine how to do it properly, like, you know, to give the freedom to developers and to engineers and at the same time, make sure we do not leak data, break GDPR or, or other stuff. Are there any solutions to that? Like you see? Yeah. So I think that the, the solutions that I see is we can start from like, number one is monitoring and discovery. So you need to actually understand where you are and like, what is your status? Mm -hmm. And in many cases, like we, we, we joked about the CISO slapping your hand. Unfortunately, in many cases, you just don't know what's going on and, and no one actually knows what's happening and you have no idea. And maybe your database is about to explode tomorrow, but you don't know. Or maybe uh, one company that I work with now, they're running my SQL 5.7 and turns out that in three months it's going to be deprecated. You're like, eh, oops, <laughs> you know, like everything's on fire. It's like, oh my God, Shimon, you gotta help us. We gotta upgrade to my SQL 8.0 and like, pfft. Um, so number one is understanding where you are. Number two is putting some, some sort of uh, guardrails 
um, maybe um, enforcement layers where it's like when I go to spin up a MySQL RDS instance, maybe it should tell me, Shimon, you should not spin up a new 5.7. You should spin a version 8 because we're going to have to clean up the mess that you're doing now in three months. So let's avoid this mess in the future. And the last part is remediation. And it's like, how do I fix the issues that I have now? And uh, of course, it's the most expensive and hard ones because you already have systems running on it and you have to put a lot of resources in that. Um, but what, what are you seeing, Roy, in terms of like, because it's funny that I have the database ex example just like happened to me. I heard about it yesterday and I... So, you know, for us as, uh, as uh, uh, I would call it a uh, company developing like the modern database stack, if you will, uh, I think it's all colliding like things that we spoke about earlier in the conversation and tapping on what you just uh, said is that the way we see it and the way like our customers and the way we see the world, even the customers aside, is that just like you said, you have to give developers autonomy and the ability to move fast. But as you scale, as your company grows, as uh, you know, you get into a state where you have uh, 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 your reputation in the market, and you, you know, each uh, production failure really hurts your customers and hurts your business. It comes to time where you can't really uh, know everything as a leader, whether it be DevOps, DBAs in our, you know, in our domain, or even engineering leader. You have to put like trust in the developer and governance and try to have them both. The way to do it is to put in the right guardrail. For example, we can talk about how do you do CI CD the right way? I'd love to hear your thoughts. How much do you see a DevOps leader needs to invest in right gating, CI CD processes, end-to-end -end testing and whatnot? And we're trying to help, for example, developers and companies do it the right way in terms of the database, how you don't break schemas, a performance, outages, configuration of the database, etc., etc., etc. And at the same time, how do you allow the ability to uh, monitor and see that everything works accordingly, everything is ready to scale, and when things do drift, how do you detect it as early as possible, whether it be a Kubernetes uh, uh, a cluster or node that are you know, uh, not on par with your SLO or SLAs, whether it be your database, are you looking to wait until you have a disaster or are you trying to be proactive and be like uh, uh, ahead of the curve, if you will? How do you put the right observability uh, in 2023? So, yeah, that's the way we see it. You want to give the developers the right tooling that integrate into their um, uh, modern workflows, cloud native workflows, and not enforcing them using like tooling that are not uh, aligned with their processes and helping and, and, and making them do things that they don't want. So I think that's the biggest challenge like for companies moving forward and moving fast. Especially around database. <laughs> but, yeah. yeah, the thing with that is like developers are already overloaded, right? Don't you think so? I mean, we already put on them so much uh, DevOps, now security, MLOps in machine learning applications, right? So we, not to mention other stuff like reporting to managers and obviously maintaining or monitoring business metrics and whatnot. So generally they are, they are overloaded. How can we help them? I mean, when I, I when I used to be a developer, that was one of the things that always, you know, bothered me that, hey, I need to do the stuff, I need to deploy it, test it, implement it, and obviously later on I need to report to all the people that are keeping asking me, hey, where are you, what is the, what are you working on right now, and like, not necessarily, I couldn't find a way how to make it easier and, you know, and, and faster, so I just can't imagine how you can put more guardrails on, like, developers doing that. It's tough, um, but 
I, I don't know if, if like the database maintenance should be like developers or like DevOps teams. It, it's a question. It's really a question. Um, but, but I think that like if, if we go back to like what are correct processes. So first of all, I'd say that the most production outages that happened to me in my entire career, it was always the database. It's either a bad migration. It's either like a Redis that started the, a working from disk instead of from memory and everything just slowed down. It's always the fucking database, pardon my French. And um, I think that today um, it's, it's become more popular to work with frameworks like DBT and having like uh, schemas that are uh, programmatically configured. Because I can give you the same example from the CI CD world of like how to not do it. It's like how to not build a good CI CD process, like install a Jenkins, then configure everything manually. Don't revision any change and just go and click on buttons. And then this, and then the DevOps person leaves and someone else has to take care of it. You're like, I don't know what the hell is going on. Like the good way to do it is like, I choose a platform that is, has like infrastructure as code for managing my CI. I don't know, GitHub action circle, whatever you like to use. Everything is revisioned. Everything is in your source control. Every change is being reviewed because it's a critical path of your infrastructure. Now, I don't know why, but in many cases I see companies that go like create table, alter, alter column, you know, just go doing whatever they want on their database. And it's like the wild, wild west. And then you wonder why the migration broke everything because there was like a, an issue there. So go back to infra as code and codify, in my opinion, uh, all of the things that you do with the database. But I'd like to really hear like Roy, what you see from, because you're like the experts in databases. Yeah. Um, an expert, it's a very, uh, strong word, but, uh, like the way we see it, you said about like maintaining the database, like we don't look at today's world, like when you say maintaining the Kubernetes cluster, it's not about maintaining. It's about like treating it like uh, the right way and like you would treat your kids, right? You wanna uh, uh, make sure they are being fed, quote unquote, with the right food. So you wanna have the ability to push the right code, the right configuration, the right YAMLs, making sure they are aligned according to the way you see the company moving forward and the company's needs. And it's about like making sure your product, your production is healthy and, you know, address issue that needs to be addressed just in time. Okay. So we don't look at it, you know, in the database perspective, now going back to the database about maintaining, we do think that in today's world, it's inevitable. And you see in the end of the day, if your production breaks, your database production is outage. You know, the, the, the person that would go, you know, figure out what happened, you know, and the, 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 the uh, 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 is going to be under uh, stress is the developer. Because usually it won't be about high availability, at least with, you know, managed services, it would be around queries exploding, indexes, temporary files, and you know, the DevOps don't have the right, DevOps personnel usually are not responsible for that. For, for that. So the way we see it in a modern company you can have each service a database. You can have a big database with several uh, schemas and each team can needs to like make sure it doesn't break this specific schema when pushing code and monitoring it, detecting drifts, like an observability, data dog observability for your application, and basically uh, have the responsibility to uh, fix things, and they need to have the right tooling to basically uh, uh, do that. And we think that in today, uh, uh, we are already uh, uh, positioned the market for developers to really have the the responsibility on the end to end, including the database. So one question that I have for you, Rui, what are the top like issues that are being caused? Like from the, you know, it, give me specific examples of the top issues that are happening. So you have uh, developers 
uh, for example, you know, one uh, obscure or uh, issue that keeps happening to our customers is like, for some reason, the database uh, statistics is not being updated or hasn't been updated in a while. Maybe it was because of configuration. Maybe it was bad deployment. And, you know, it's not that something has changed. Just the statistic was not uh, updated. And the thing that happened is that suddenly the optimizer thinks, okay, that's the statistic I know about. So one query can take now 10 minutes or I'm exaggerating for a minute because the statistic is not up to date with what the database uh, is currently doing. So basically you have locking of your data. Basically your customer can access their data, which is something horrible. This is one thing. We have developer just using an ORM and having the N plus one day after day after day, we keep seeing it. Like developer using ORM, dev teams and say, you know what, I don't want to know anything about it. But that's the thing, it works when you are on day zero, but it will never work once you have your 10, 15, 20 customers. I can't imagine the company you worked at with 1000 engineer working blindly with ORM. Horrible decision. Um, Is it the and worst for example, thing ever? Because when you put it in, it works perfectly. And then as you add more and more customers, it degrades and degrades until it just breaks. And like you didn't change anything. It's crazy. Yeah. And not only that, you see a SQL, which is slow, but you never wrote the SQL. You wrote the JavaScript. You used an entity. What do you mean? I never wrote the, this thing. I know nothing about it. Like, how do I fix it? And the third thing is like developers not being mindful of how they deploy uh, queries. If you go to a relational database, thinking about not only about like what kind of data I'm returning, but how do I do it? We have like companies finding they're scanning five tables, million rows and returning two rows, like which is crazy and doing it on a query that runs thousands of times uh, like a day. So just on top of my head, those are three things that keep coming back and it bites you in the worst, worst time on Christmas Eve, on your Fridays nights, uh, yeah. So, but not only that, think about configuration and I don't wanna be very long about what, what we're seeing happening around schema migration, losing your data, need, having the, the, the need to revert the database snapshot, which is crazy for a company. You can uh, be very sympathetic about the notion of reverting to previous snapshots of your database, which is great. Yeah, talking about migrations, recently I met a guy from one of the, I don't want to give names, but that was one of the biggest companies that you probably uh, go to their website when you go for vacations and want to find a place where to stay for the night. Uh, so he told me that they have, uh, they had a migration that was running for over a month. Uh, that wasn't expected, uh, and yeah, uh, if that breaks in the middle, you are in big troubles. <laughs> Crazy. Uh, yeah. I wish there would be a day that we will have a migration running for a month. <laughs> cool. Um, so generally, it uh, seems like we covered quite a lot, uh, like we mentioned various challenges, we mentioned guardrails, we mentioned database issues, and like wrap up thoughts you would like to share with the audience anything that comes to your mind at the end yeah i think that the number one issue of companies is like premature optimization so like it's totally okay to build things in a non-scalable way and once you hit product market fit and once you get the customers no worries there are a lot of uh, companies uh, that can help you with scaling and i think that at this point you need to start looking at what you've built and start uh, like peeling off the onion and uh, peel by peel and, and you know taking it and making it into separate services and just treating it as a, a specific unit and this way by separating them you can get into a ownership and stability by different areas um, and don't do it too early because a company that does it too early won't get into the <laughs> growth phase, I guess. I agree, but uh, 
I totally agree with just what Shimon said. Uh, no need to add about it. I'm just going to say that once you hit the scale, from like my advice would be when you really hit the scale, I'm not talking about few customers, it's okay to stop for a second and prepare for the next step and really prepare in terms of like, we talked about all those observability and CI, CD. Don't be afraid to call it top priority in the right time. Just like Shimon said, there is a right time for everything, but uh, more times than none, I see companies afraid to call a priority on doing observability, CI, CD, and other others to prepare them, like you're preparing your company for sales motions and scale in the sales. Don't be afraid to have it as a priority in the right time, exactly like Shimon said. That's my advice for and, engineering. And, and so you said companies are afraid. Why are they afraid? Because pressure comes when they think they want to compete in the market and they need to have features and more features and, you know, uh, more times than none, like they think that if they want release more features that, you know, the market would per be, uh, perceive them as, you know, not innovative or their, uh, uh, um, uh, what's called, their competitor will, you know, uh, uh, be faster than them. But sometimes like this, being more uh, uh, the slowest part is the fastest part. Like, because if you're going to break and you're going to hurt your reputation and we can see about what happened in terms of security, oh, you know what, talking about database, what happened to uh, Atlassian to their database? 30% of their customers weren't able to access the data uh, and the product because something broke in their database. You don't want to get there. So sometimes like, yeah, it's okay to say I'm going to be less uh, fruitful and uh, in terms of features, but it's the main feature is my uh, production health and, and processes. It will help me scale to the next level. Cool. Sounds good and couldn't agree more, I guess. Uh, okay, I think it's time to call it a day then. Let's move on to our picks of this show. Uh, so, Roy, uh, where do you stay now? So I live in a city called Petah Tikva, and Shimon as an Israeli uh, citizen is joking, which is basically like the Florida for um, uh, Israel. Basically, when you are old, you're going to Petah Tikva, uh, but I'm not that old yet. And but, yet you're uh, still retired. <laughs> but yet I'm not retired. I just got married. Oh, okay. <laughs> lovely. Uh, lovely. So any good food place uh, in Petah Tikva? 100% none, honestly. And I'm not joking, like none. A very, you know what, maybe a place called Pit Pitmaster, which Pit is Master, like a barbecue yeah, yeah. joint. That's a good Pit one, Master. that's a good yeah. meat place. That's a good one. Like, I think maybe that's the only one I would consider like a good place. But if you ask me where would I go eat and if I want to promote something, I would call it like a place called Oro, which is gold in Spanish but it's basically a wine bar in a neighborhood near where Shimon lives. And it's a small place, like, and if we're uh, all about, like, promoting very cool places, which, like, uh, are not trying to be, like, a chains and, like, try to serve local communities, uh, I would promote them, go check them out. I really like them. Okay, cool. Uh, Shimon, now moving on to you. I heard you know some good places in San Francisco. Yeah, so I, I wanted to give a more, you know, broad recommendation. So there's a great fly, place called Epic Steak. It's in San Francisco in the Embarcadero. It's an awesome place. Me and my co-founder, when we were, we were spent a lot of time in San Francisco, we love this place and we love it so much that my co-founder has an Israeli name that no American can pronounce. So he decided to add uh, another name and the name he decided to add is Epic. <laughs> I, so, ba so basically er is epic epic yeah epic zilberman yeah yeah i thought it's uh because of like the gaming uh company right uh epic no no it, it's no. we we were really drunk at the steakhouse and he's like you should definitely call yourself epic it's an epic name and it's a good place and 
Long story short, if you go into the Y Combinator listing in the book face, and his name is actually ER Epic Zimmerman. Uh, the entire podcast was worth only because of this story, Shimon. Honestly. <laughs> Yeah, I that, like that is awesome. And now we know some hidden gems uh, of some people. That is lovely. And be hey, Adam, what is in uh, Krakow? Oh, that's you have that's to share as well. So many good places around here. One I could recommend is called a uh, Kompania Kuflova pod Wawelem. Wawel is a castle in Krakow, and there is this place which is uh, kept in this old communist vibe. Uh, so you can go there, get something like free pound uh, uh, chop stick, uh, chop pork, and um, so you can eat quite a lot. But the best thing is when you go to the restroom and you can hear, listen to some really dry dad jokes coming from the speaker. So this is lovely. It really makes you know the time flow a little faster if you know if you catch my drift. <laughs> Uh, Simon, we gotta go to Krakow. Definitely, definitely. We got hundred percent. Okay, folks, thank you for being on this show. Thank you for attending, and for everyone, thank you for tuning in to this episode of New Age Engineering. All the links, all the materials we mentioned will be added to the notes, and hopefully, you enjoyed it, and you'll tune in for the next episode. Have a great thank day. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you.